Welcome again to our continuing education series and thank you as always to our sponsor, Greater Winston-Salem Inc. A um, little housekeeping, just wanna bring you up to date on our next two uh, panels next Tuesday at four o'clock Eastern time. Uh, we'll have Making It to the Majors with Jeff Arnold and Melanie Newman, who are two of the new hires on the Baltimore Orioles broadcast team, and Noah Eagle, who is in the middle of his first season as the radio play-by-play -play voice of the LA Clippers when the pandemic hit. And then next Thursday at four, Steve Hers, who's the president of the Montag Group and its management, uh, will talk about uh, do you need an agent and when, if you need an agent, what are the attributes you need to have uh, to get noticed, and then uh, once you have that job, what do you need to do to get better? Um, and so we're looking forward to those, but uh, let me open by thanking our guests today, David Teal, Grace Rayner, and Michael Wallace. Uh, David and I, uh, I guess, go the farthest or furthest back from the time I uh, came down to the ACC after covering the Big East, and then had most of the Big East follow me down here to North Carolina. Uh, David, long time, sports reporter for the Daily Press in uh, Newport News and just recently has switched over to the Richmond Times-Dispatch and uh, how many Virginia Sports Sports Writer of the Year awards and uh, how many Virginia Sports Writer of the, awards, of the Year awards in Virginia? 13? Oh, it's my um, redundancy. I, I 12, think, 13? I think that's right, he said with humility. Um, Mike Wallace, I met a couple years ago at a uh, conference in Nashville that the uh, Vanderbilt Student Media put on for college students and hit it off immediately with Michael. He, uh, some of you may remember him as an ESPN Miami guy when he was babysitting LeBron James, but started in the newspaper business and uh, now multi-platform guy for Grind City Media, which is the Memphis Grizzlies uh, media arm. Michael, welcome, good to see you as always. Hey, thank you. Thank you for having me, man. I'm, I'm looking forward to this, and thanks a lot for inviting me back. My pleasure. And Grace Rayner, Grace, I'm, I think I actually met you, Grace, uh, in the press box at Bank of America Stadium in Charlotte. And then in short order, I think you've tied for the South Carolina Sports Writer of the Year twice, which makes you a two-time South Carolina Sports Writer of the Year. So welcome, Grace. And uh, you know, I, I try to put together a diverse group, ages, et cetera, people who have been veterans in the business, some who aren't, and that way we get all kinds of viewpoints out there, which I think is important. So let's kick it off with um, why it's important to become a report, maybe a good reporter first, maybe even before you become a good writer. Uh, David, why don't you uh, lead us off? Well, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you just called me old. Uh, with your, uh, you're the one who grew the white white beard, not me. <laughs> well, <laughs> one point very well taken. And please excuse the thunderstorm uh, in the background. And and Dave, I think you have the priorities exactly correct in that we need to be competent or excel at reporting uh, before writing. And to me, the, the only way to do that is through preparation and curiosity. Uh, whatever it is that you are covering, I mean, I think I speak for most all of us here, we're blessed to be in sports media, which is something that would interest us whether we were in the business or not. But I can't imagine sitting in a city council meeting because I would be bored stiff. It does not interest me. I have no knowledge about it. When you've been a sports fan since you were old enough to walk and talk and watch TV, it becomes a heck of a lot easier. And then it's, there's the preparation. And there is nothing a coach or a player or an administrator can see faster than a reporter who is ill prepared. If you don't know your subject matter, they will figure that out so quickly and you will find that they become, and rightfully so by the way, dismissive, abrupt, because you haven't been professional enough 
to do your homework. And I'll give you an example of an experience I had on the flip side of that. In my last year at the Daily Press, I was there 36 years, and we had we hired a new editor-in-chief, not sports editor, but a new editor. And she sent out an email wanting to have one-on-ones with all the staff. Now, we weren't a big paper. It's a small staff. And so it was my turn. And I walked in there, and her first question was, so tell me what you do here. <laughs> And I thought to myself, if one of your reporters went out on an interview as ill-prepared as you are right now, you'd have them fired. And I was just amazed. And she did the same exercise. With them. She just had clearly done no homework. And I thought it affected the, the rest of our conversation. Um, so I'll, I'll quit rambling, but I, I think it's really a combination of curiosity and preparation. I have to unmute myself first. Michael, you want to weigh in there? <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, I'll pick up on uh, to Dave's point. You're right. You, you have to. And then let me first apologize. I'm having weather here in, uh, in Memphis as well. So if there's any you know, lag or, or computer issues or Wi-Fi issues, I apologize on behalf of Xfinity and Comcast. <laughs> so don't blame me, blame them. But, you know, the thing about it is that you will, as a reporter, you're just a natural, curious person. And, and I think that applies whether you're covering sports, whether you're covering crime, whether you're covering education. Uh, for me, you know, I, I knew I always wanted to be in sports reporting um, and broadcasting. But I had to go a different route. My, my first couple of years in the industry started out with me covering courts, crime, cops, uh, education. And then when you think about it, all of those things still apply when I switched over to sports. Because when I was covering college football and college athletics, guess what? Players were getting arrested. The NCAA process is all about, you know, legalese and being able to go to hearings and things of that nature. Um, and then as we see in, in today's society, uh, you know, covering communities and, and social unrest and issues, those take you outside of the norms of what uh, traditional game coverage is all about. So, you know, a reporter is a reporter by nature. A re good reporter can cover anything because it's about getting the re best facts, getting the story together, and then organizing your details. So, but being a reporter first means you start by being curious and uh, and taking that curiosity to 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 get answers to what uh, your your audience needs to know, wants to know, and you keep them engaged. I've always said that we are we're all news reporters. It just happens for most of us now that sports is our beat. Yeah. Right. Grace, how about you? I think both of them, you know, basically hit the nail on the head. I mean, the way that I kind of try to think about it is. I can always go back in the writing process and tweak things and, you know, change things up and, and tinker with that. But a lot of times when your interview is done, like sometimes that's it. So um, I think one of the worst things that you can do to a reader is leave them with questions that are not answered. And so that's why I think the reporting process is so important that, you know, you, you just, you go in prepared as David was talking about, like you're curious. I mean, a lot of times I cover Clemson um, football. And so, you know, with a beat that is as big as Clemson has become, you know, a lot of times we don't get special access or follow-ups, you know, so it's get your question in the press conference and then you go home. So I just, I just think that you can't stress enough how important it is to be prepared uh, both for yourself and for your readers. Information is a big part of, of what we all do. Uh, I think we lost David, at least for the moment. But so, Grace, why don't you stay on and, and tell me how you, how you developed your method of or methods of research, gathering information, and then organizing it. Because, you know, no matter, no matter which medium we happen to work in, you know, and I was in TV and I've been in radio and newspaper TV. You'd, you'd go out, do these long interviews and have to, have to come back and sit there and log them. You guys have to transcribe your interviews. Um, talk about your, your process a little bit. 
Sure. So um, before I ever go into an interview, especially if it's, you know, feature a subject that I'm trying to get to know a, a little bit more personally, maybe they have like an emotional backstory or something. I'm just trying to read first everything that I can on this person, you know, whether it's um, all the way from, you know, their Clemson bio to the local newspaper who wrote about them when they were a sophomore in high school before they got to Clemson. I'm just trying to like devour as much as I can from as many sources as possible to sort of paint a picture of like, okay, this is what I need to know about this person before I go into it. And then in terms of like organizing the interviews, um, I, I mean, I hate transcribing. It's probably the worst, the worst one of the worst parts of our entire job, mm -hmm. but um, I think there's some value in kind of, I always transcribe everything unless it's just absurdly long because sometimes I miss things first or sometimes there was a tone of voice or a follow-up question that I, I didn't realize I asked in the moment but was glad I did later. So I just believe in, in organizing as much as you can. Like I always say, you can, you can never, I would much rather have too much than too little. So um, I just, I, ha I mean, right now, every year I have a, a Dabo Sweeney Google Doc and every year I start over and every year I would say on average it finishes at about 150, 160 pages. So it's a lot, but you know, and that, that's just, that's just good for you too to, then you can go back if you need it, you can reference it. But I really like having everything in one place. Did, did you have to buy extra Google space? Because I'm, I'm getting just close. Because of Dabo? Sure. <laughs> I'm getting close. <laughs> Uh, how do you organize that? I mean, are you, are you able to find a, I mean, do you put subjects together? Do you do it chronologically? How would you, how would it, how would you organize that 150, 150 pages of Dabo? Yeah, I do it chronologically and I always date it. And I cannot tell you how many times that he'll say something and it'll remind me, I th you know, I think he brought this up in September and then I just control F for the word I'm looking for. And, <laughs> Oh my gosh, it saved me so many times. And a lot of times too, it's kind of cool to, you know, if he's talking about a player, you can, in, in this document, you can see the, the progress this player is. Okay, this is how he talked about him in August. Now we're here in November. But yeah, I do everything chronologically and, and date it and just add to it every time we talk to him. Michael, you want to weigh in on your, your research development and organization uh, process? Yes. I mean, those, those are some great points. And, and one of the things that makes, you know, opportunities like this valuable is because yes, we, we are the presenters, so to speak on, on a panel like this, but I'm also here taking notes and learning uh, from everyone as well. And, and one of the things that, you know, I, I went to a historically black college and university, Grambling State University uh, in Louisiana, coached by legendary coach, Eddie Robinson. So everyone from Bear Bryant to Dabo Sweeney to Bobby Bowden all took lessons uh, from, from Eddie Robinson in one way or another uh, from talking to them directly. But one of the things that Eddie Robinson used to tell me, uh, even when I was a student at Grambling, was that he always went to clinics, coaching clinics and uh, national conventions, and he would always sit on the first or second row, and he would always have his pencil and his notebook there. Now, here's the thing about Eddie Robinson. He won 408 games, more than anyone else in the, in, in, in the history of college football at the time. He could have been teaching each one of those panels. He could have been uh, conducting those panels. But what impressed other legendary coaches about him was his desire to continue to be a learner in that process. You never master your information. And I think uh, one of the things that's important about us and what I did today, as a matter of fact, I did an interview with an NBA player who's just coming back into the, the region to start workouts. And it's easy to talk to these guys about the sport that they play or, 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 or their, their dominant field. What I use to try to get into those interviews and get information is what's the next best thing that they care about? What's the second most important thing that they care about? So for instance, uh, this particular basketball player, uh, I could talk to him all day about basketball. So what I wanted to know to open them up a little bit was, what project did you get done during this NBA hiatus, this COVID-19 quarantine where you were staying at home? What did you accomplish that you're most proud of outside of basketball? And I found out that this Lithuanian seven foot center, Jonas Valanciunas, learned how to become a, 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 a sushi chef. <laughs> and, and, and so, I mean, you know, it's, it's one of those things where we started talking about organic foods and things of that nature to get into what his backstory was about in terms of how he uh, spent his time in quarantine. So 
that's going to make for an interesting story, more so than his rebounding and what kind of shape he's in. We're going to get to all of that. So I think if you can find a way to get someone to open up to give you the information to get into your reporting and your story, I think that's also important. So we can make that somehow into a video story as well, because I'd love to see the seven foot Lithuanian uh, you know, rolling, roll a little California rolling sushi. Roll. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and in our, our industry now, because I mean, I work for newspapers just like Dave did. I mean, we both started, uh, he started just a little bit before I did. So yes, he, I, I guess he is the oldest on the panel here, but you know, in experience wise, I started and the industry completely, completely changed. So now we're a digital media company. So not mm -hmm. just writing it for an online written piece, but also being able to tell that story uh, through images and videos and things of that nature is also going to be important. So yeah, we'll try to get them in the uh, in, in a kitchen somewhere, chopping up some uh, some sushi rolls and, and lining things up that way. Yeah, awesome. Dave, David has rejoined us. Lost his hotspot. He uh, he texted back. David, we're talking, you know, gathering your information and research and um, how you organize it. What what's your process? Well, I I. I got back in after the thunderstorm knocked out our, our wireless. I was listening to Grace and her talk about her 160 page uh, annual Dabo. Uh, I tend to save transcripts as, as well, but also documents, PDFs. Uh, I covered the ACC a lot. So I have, every ACC tax return going back for more than a decade and keep those handy coaches contracts uh, those kind of things that you might get through FOIA uh, so I keep files of those and again dating myself I have old-fashioned files under my desk you know just this thick with papers and uh, my my wife has scolded me. She wants to come in here and throw out my old media guides, and I'm like, no, no, oh, no, <laughs> this this can't happen. I might need one in five years. The 1985 UVA basketball. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and, and seriously, the minute you throw it away is, of course, the minute you're going to want it. But just just things like that, just. At the risk of being a pack rat like my father, I just, I, I don't throw much away. Yeah, I just, uh, I was down in the archive room the other day and, and happened to find a program from a, I guess it was a 1979 or 1980 American Hockey League game that I had probably gone to as an intern working for a TV station in Syracuse. And, oh, I, I saw Bruce Boudreau, a coach in the NHL play in the AHL. I mean, those, those are the cool things for me to go see those memories. But, but for you guys, it's great to have those facts and, and that historical perspective. David, I think I've probably, I've probably shown you and, and Michael and maybe Grace as well, and maybe some others on here. Um, I discovered, I went back a, a game program for my freshman year at Syracuse, a picture of the coaching staff. And I, I had no idea that Nick Saban was on the coaching staff in Syracuse for one year. And he was in that picture. I mean, it, that blew my mind. 1977 fall of. So um, let, let's talk about developing sources and mutual trust. David, you kind of touched on that at the beginning a little bit. Um, you want to expound on that? Sure. It's, it's essential and you have to be patient because it requires time and some sources are just, and again, often with good reason, they are weary. Maybe they've had a bad experience or they're just naturally shy. And that can be difficult to work through, but I, if you show them preparation, if you show them empathy and understanding, I, I think Michael made a great point I'm not even going to try to pr pronounce the seven-foot Lithuanian's name, but 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 I I thought his point was so well taken in, in that he asked him just a non-basketball question and got him talking about something that he was interested in. When you show someone 
that you are genuinely interested. You know, be a person first and a reporter second and just let the conversation evolve. I see Andrew Allegretta is, is, is on with us today and Andrew knows well the former Virginia Tech athletic director, Jim Weaver. Well, Jim, like myself, became a father very late in life. And so we had that in common. And it never failed whenever we started a, a conversation, even though we both knew it would become a business conversation. The, the first uh, order of business was to ask about the other's family. You know, how, how's your son doing it? Jim's asking, how, how's Tiny Teal? And over time that developed, you know, a, a relationship, so to speak, and then in, in the latter part of Jim's tenure as athletic director, he was diagnosed with Parkinson's. The one reporter he trusted enough to tell that story to and to tell it in the presence of his wife and his son and to allow me access to his sister. Um, and that was the product of the mutual trust and respect that we had built up uh, over the years. And uh, I think you can see it in, in Michael's story of, uh, about the basketball player. And I see it with Grace's work all the time at, at Clemson. She hasn't been on the beat that long, but, but you can tell she has developed a rapport with folks and one of her recent stories that I think she may still have pinned to her uh, to her Twitter was this in-depth look at a big recruiting weekend at, at Clemson and it was not only re reporting from a FOIA standpoint but you could tell that she had developed sources and people were comfortable talking to her and, and, and telling her things and I think that speaks uh, to the trust and respect that she's built there at Clemson in a very short period of time. Grace, you want to talk a little bit about that? And Sure. Thanks, Hugh. Oh, my gosh. Good. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, you know, I think as a, as a young reporter, that's been one of the hardest things is trying to develop those relationships and get comfortable with someone that you just met um but i think like everything teal said was spot on i mean it's just about a mutual respect and it's about knowing that you're going to handle things uh, professionally fairly and delicately accurately all of those things um and i think that you know once once you prove that that's what you're going to do on a regular basis and that's the norm for you it becomes a lot easier, uh, but the, I, I don't have all the answers on that by any means because I'm still very much in that part of trying to get more comfortable with people like Clemson and catch up to some of these guys who've been on the beat, you know, for 15, 20 years. Generally, I think most people would assume maybe easier for for you, Grace and David, because you cover college sports mainly. Mike, you covered uh, NBA for for a long time. Has there been a difference over the years in, in especially access, which is, which is gold for, for reporters? Oh, yes. I mean, it's, it's definitely, uh, you know, depending on what level of sports you're covering, uh, the, the access, you know, can be drastically different. You know, um, you know, I pretty much cut my teeth covering SEC football, uh, ACC basketball back in the day uh, at Florida State um, before I got into the NFL and then ultimately the NBA. And, you know, access, especially at the college level, I, I don't even know right now if I could go back and be successful covering colleges with the way things are now. Um, I, I remember covering the SEC back when Houston Nutt uh, was coaching at Arkansas. And back then, reporters can go into the locker room, you know, at Arkansas. You know, I remember interviewing Matt Jones at his locker in a college locker room. Um, so, you know, th that doesn't exist anymore. You know what I mean? Um, you, you basically get paraded out one or two players a week um, and it's difficult 
in the NBA and my role here with Bryan City Media, because I'm, I'm internal media, mm -hmm. uh, I travel with the team. I'm on the team charter. Uh, I stay at the team hotel. I'm on the teams per diem. Um, so that's not necessarily a traditional reporter by any stretch. It's more brand journalism. But the reason why this method is successful for a growing number of professional teams is because they're, they're hiring uh, traditional uh, media members uh, who have a reputation of, of being, you know, solid, objective, for the most part, reporters. Um, having said all of that, you still have to build trust, and it takes a long time uh, for guys. And you might not have everyone in the locker room trust you or every administrator, but if you, if you have to show up, and I'll, 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 I'll keep it short and sweet by saying this, you, the quickest way for you to gain trust from the people that you're covering is to be there every day. For them to know that you're there, and if you write something controversial or something that's deemed to, to rub someone the wrong way, show up the next day, give them an opportunity to vent, and then show up the day after that so that they know you're still there to do your job. And they can rely on your access to them just like you want to rely on their access to you. It go, it's, a, it's, a, it's a symbiotic relationship when it comes to that, and uh, you gradually build trust that way. Hey, since you brought it up, you, you work for the team. Yes. Have you found it different at all than your previous life? Oh, of course, of course. And, and, and it's, it's, man, it's, it's, it can get frustrating, you know. Um, I, I, and to be completely transparent and honest, uh, we, we've all seen how the nation right now is reacting to, uh, you know, the, the shooting, police shooting in Minnesota, Minneapolis. We have two players on the Memphis Grizzlies team right now, Tyus Jones, who played at Duke, and uh, Gorgie Jang, who played at Louisville. Uh, ACC schools, by the way, they played in Minnesota for a big part of their career. And they both have been active on social media today and yesterday, uh, calling for peace, calling for, you know, uh, uh, you know, civil disobedience, but also, you know, they're hurting right now. And what, if, if I was with ESPN or if I was with the Commercial Appeal or local paper or something like that, I would naturally snap into reaching out to those guys to tell their story. Mm -hmm. um, as an internal media, uh, I've spent all of my day-to-day -day leading up to this conference trying to massage executives, uh, public relations officials within the team to allow those players to speak to me about that so I can help shape what their vision of the story is. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it gets frustrating because instinctively, I'm, I'm a journalist, man. You know, I like to go mm -hmm. tell the story and get it. But when you're on the team side of it, there are other hoops to jump through to make sure to make sure you're not putting your team at risk. What kind of image is it going to project out to the public and all of those things? So there, there's a, there's a tug of war there, but but it's one that I'm I'm, I'm I love waging because I, I need to keep them honest and they need to keep me understanding that this is a different job than I was at ESPN as well. So it's 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 a tug of war, but it's a good one. Cool. Let's talk a little bit about okay, you, you've mastered if you ever do the be, becoming a good reporter thing first. I mean, everyone's born with a different talent to write. Some people develop it well. Some people are, are just good reporters. Um, talk to me about becoming a good writer and what that means to you. Um, Grace, why don't you kick us off there? I think that that's um, something that's <laughs> always evolving, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, I would be lying if I said I wasn't in a little bit of a writing funk right now, so I don't know that I'm the best person to answer this right now, but, um, you know, I think you just, for me, like when I, I don't know if there are any students on here, but for me, writing for mm -hmm. my um, college newspaper was so valuable because it was a, a very like low risk environment for me to take some creative risks and kind of find out what works for me, what doesn't. And, um, you know, it was just a, a really cool experience to kind of explore, you know, and try to figure out who am I going to be as a writer. So that, that helped a lot, but I just, you know, I try to read people that I respect and, and really like a lot and that definitely helps me when I'm struggling um, but I think it's just about finding your voice and what works for you and, and what you're comfortable and confident with. As a student even coming up through grade school middle school high school did you have English teachers say you're a really good creative writer or whatever and that kind of built or no? Did I? Yeah. Um, no, not really. Um, <laughs> I, I, I really didn't figure out I wanted to be a journalist until I got to college. So, um, I, 
I don't, yeah, I don't know. The academic writing side of things I always struggled with. I did have professors say that I wrote too casually, which was probably a little bit of the journalism thing, but mm -hmm. um, that was like a, that was something that I discovered I wanted to do a little bit later. David Teal, how about you? Well, just to piggyback on what Grace, I, I don't think you can read enough. Uh, just, I mean, again, I, I grew up reading Sports Illustrated and the Washington Post and people like Dave Kindred and Tony Kornheiser and Curry Kirkpatrick and just Thomas Boswell, just giants in, in our field and Frank DeFord and you just, even though in the back of your mind you think, damn it, I'm never going to be that good. <laughs> you, 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 you strive in, in some way to at least a, a approach that standard. And then you do, you, you kind of figure out what works best for you. And I, I once had an editor friend tell me that it's not a bad idea to read your stuff to yourself aloud because it's, it's rhythm. It's at the risk of overstating, and it, it, it's almost like music, and that it, it needs to have a certain rhythm as as you're reading it, and sometimes doing that aloud really does help. Unmute yourself, Dave. Because somebody just texted me and said, if you mute yourself, you won't have a, my wife's teaching kindergarten in the kitchen. That's probably the noise. Um, but, but read, 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 write, write, write. And then for especially the younger crowd, network your behind off. <laughs> and that, those are, are three of the pieces of advice I give. Um, Mike Wallace, how about you? Be becoming yeah. a good writer. Um, I, I wish I had the secret. I'm, I'm still searching for it. You know, and, and, you know, one of the things that, that I, I tell uh, students and, and young professionals uh, and, and speak with even veterans all the time is, is it normal for me to feel like writing is the most excruciating process in all of this? And, and it is, like, especially when I think I have a really good feature column or a feature story uh, where I have a little bit of space to stretch out. Um, you know, it's, it's not uncommon for me to, to, to sit at a desk in my house and, and still be writing at 3 a.m. in the morning um, and then wake up at 6 and redo something and then get back into it. It's, it's like surgery uh, to me because I'm my biggest critic and I'm never satisfied because I think I suck at writing. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then, you know, it's always, the, it, it's always been the, the pieces that I felt the worst about from a writing standpoint that most other people tend to enjoy and comment on that they, they, they like the best. So I've never been able to figure out that, that, that rhythm. Um, but what I try to do is as, as both Grace and David said, you know, read as much as I can, uh, read different styles of writing. Uh, one of the uh, tips that uh, a reporter when I was interning, man, 25 years ago at the Birmingham news told me was when you're finished writing and you think you're finished, read your piece backwards. So go to the final paragraph and work your way back up, reading it one paragraph at a time. So that way you're, you're making sure that you have clarity in every single paragraph. You can catch typos great doing it that way too, because your mind is trained to read what you, what you intend to say, as opposed to actually what's there. So you gotta use different tools and tricks to try to uh, massage your way through becoming a better writer. Uh, but at the end of the day, when you find your inner voice, and I know we're gonna get to that too, but once you find your inner voice and what, number one, figure out uh, what you're trying to say. Number two, figure out what your audience is that you're trying to reach. And number three, figure out what you want your audience to take away from what you're saying. Um, and, and I think once you answer those three questions as you go through the process, uh, I think it becomes more clear as you get through it. But it's still an excruciating challenge for me every day deciding what is important and what's not. Uh, Grace talked about having, and you all, you've all had it, uh, or have it on a regular basis, uh, a lot more. You, you gather a lot more than you'll need. How do you decide what's important? Um, Grace, why don't you lead on that? 
Um, I usually, I try to, I, I usually find that what is most important is as soon as I'm finished reporting, I, I call my editor and I have a conversation with her. And usually the first things that I tell her about what I've just gathered are usually the most important. I just think that we naturally tend to, I found that most of the time, what I think is most important is probably what my reader is also going to think is most important. And so, um, I know a lot of writers who outline and, and I do that with bigger pieces and that helps a lot with organization. But I think in terms of, you know, the meat and potatoes, I've found that it's a little bit more instinctual than I sometimes think it is. Like I'm, I'm a perpetual overthinker, but when you strip it all down and you're telling your mom or you're telling your friend, or you're telling your editor what this story is about, usually the first things that pop out are going to be what you need to get up high. David Teal agree with that? I do, and self-editing to me is, I mean, I, Michael mentioned earlier, he doesn't think he's a good writer. There are times when I think I'm the worst <laughs> self-editor that, that, that there is, and it's, you, you really do have to try to, to master that, because let's face it, folks, in this day and age, with smaller and smaller media staffs, there are fewer and fewer editors, and often we are flying without a parachute. And that makes self-editing even more essential. And I'm very fortunate in that my wife probably knows more about sports than I do. She's a huge fan and is intensely interested in what I do. And so much like Grace in her initial conversation with her editor, I find when I'm talking to Jill and trying to explain something to her, then yeah, what I, what I first mentioned to her is probably the most important. And it's kind of a antiquated concept, but there is such a thing as the nut graph. And you've got to figure out what that is. And my, my daughter is, is reading a series of books online called Nellie Nutgraph, <laughs> which just I, I adore because it kind of plays right into what daddy does for, for a living. But, but Nellie figures it out. And I uh, encourage each of you, and as I encourage myself every day, to, to, to find that and make sure it's pretty darn high up so folks know why they're reading. Michael, how about you? How do you, how do you make, decide what's important, what's not? You know, I, I, it's, it's, it also depends on what kind of piece you're writing or what kind of piece you're producing. Um, you know, if it's something designed to have a little bit more of your voice in it, uh, you know, you have, more space, more time, more opportunity to, to flex opinion and, and insight um, and your vantage point. Uh, if you're doing more of a news angle piece or more of a, a reaction to something that happened, uh, you have to get the details. It's, it's simple, you know, who, what, when, where, why, uh, this is important. And then you, you flesh out in the inverted pyramid style. That's, that's still tested, tried and true uh, today, you know, in, in different formats. So it's just a matter of, of what kind of story you're trying to tell, more so now than, than maybe earlier in my career. Um, I'm more of an analyst, more of a columnist type voice. Uh, so I usually allow what happened to speak sort of for itself. And I'm telling you why it happened and why it's to be important to me, why it may be important to you. Uh, so that's all, all, all part of that process there. But again, it's still regimented and I, I think it really depends on uh, what kind of style you're taking and what your assignment is for that particular story. Well, let me finish up on, on developing your voice and then we'll, we'll throw it open to questions. Mm -hmm. um, David, how long did it take for you to develop your voice in your writing? And was, was that one of the, I, I used to hear that and it used to drive me nuts because I really didn't know what it meant. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure I do either. <laughs> and if I have developed it, um, maybe somebody can point it out. <laughs> because I, I think it varies from, from story to story. And Michael was mentioning that his role is more now a, a, a columnist and an analyst. And I think we all take more of that role now because again, 
smaller staves and so much more available media for consumers, all of us need to be more versatile. I, I think we're all analysts, we're all columnists, we're all reporters. Uh, being adept at just one of those things probably won't get you hired. And if it does, it probably won't keep you employed very long. So I think it all depends <clears throat> on the type of story. You're t are you writing long form narrative on, on, on a profile or on, on an event? Or are you writing a 650 word column where you're praising or, or criticizing someone? And um, the, the tone you take depends on the assignment uh, of, of each uh, or uh, that, that you have. Thank you. Grace, how about you? Have you, have you developed your voice yet? I don't think so. And there's <laughs> a small part of me that kind of hopes I don't in a way. I mean, not to, I don't know. Like I would obviously, I, I hope that my voice is always evolving. Like I hope I don't get to the point where I'm just like, this is it, you know, take it or leave it. So um, I don't, I, I think that's maybe, maybe your post writing career, maybe that's something I would talk about, but I, I just hope that it's changing and getting smarter and, you know, constantly figuring out how to serve my readers in the best way. Makes sense to me. All right, let's do some questions here. Uh, Robert Eggleston has a couple and you can either do them in chat or hit your, uh, your little hand raise icon there. Uh, Robert Eggleston, one of our NSMA board members here in Winston-Salem. First, he asked, Grace, is that annual Dabo Sweeney Google Doc the makings of a future book? That's a good question. A lot of people have asked me that. Um, I mean, it, if I ever did want to make it into a book, that'd be the first place that I would start. I mean, there's just anecdotes galore and all of his rants are in there. Um, <laughs> on his birthday, actually, he turned 50 this past year. And we did a big story on like 50 of his most memorable moments. And that was like my saving grace because I looked through all of them and it made me laugh and some of them made me mad, but um, I don't know. I, it's not something immediately on my mind, but it's funny you mentioned that because a lot of people have asked that same question. Well, you'll, you'll certainly have a, uh, a lot of material when and if the time comes. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> um, Rob, uh, David Robert also uh, said he grew up in Waynesboro, Virginia, reading Bill Millsaps and Bill Brill, two guys for, with whom you were very familiar. Any good stories about them? Oh, <laughs> probably not for... Uh, <laughs> for, for this public, is being recorded. <laughs> yeah, it's for, for, for public consumption. But they were both such dear friends and, and mentors. I, I cannot thank either of them en enough. And we just lost Saps recently. Brill passed away in uh, 2010, I want to say, or 11. But they were so kind to, to me and countless others, uh, young reporters who really, we, we, we hinged on every word they wrote and said. We, we followed their lead. We wanted to be like them. And they, they, never, they never looked down at us. They were always gracious and uh, eager to, to, to help and bring the next generation along. And uh, just really can't thank them enough. Great. Sunil, you have a question? You want to unmute yourself? Yeah, thanks, Dave. Um, you know, I had a question about uh, future articles. Um, you know, I recently did uh, an article on a high school baseball coach where, you know, most of it was, you know, uh, a lot of quotes. So I'm uh, wondering about the balance, you know, between, you know, including quotes. I mean, I interviewed the coaches, you know, mom, you know, assistant coaches, two of them. So I'm just wondering, I mean, before I knew it, I was close to 5,000 words, you know, I had typed up. So I, I'm just curious, you know, I said if uh, – Someone just had, you know, advice, you know, between, you know, uh, Michael, Grace, and uh, David. Anybody want to just unmute and just go right ahead? I think sometimes as, as writers, I know th this definitely 
uh, pertains to me is we lean too heavily on quotes and we become stenographers instead of storytellers and reporters. Uh, can the subject tell the story better than we can? Sometimes. And hey, there are some stories because the quotes are so good and so irresistible that yes, the, the, the piece becomes quote heavy. But I think in the interest of time and space, there are, are more times than not where paraphrasing works and you can condense what the subject has said. You can either attribute it to them if it's more of a newsy piece or if it's more of a profile, you can make it more narrative and you can just state it because you know it's true. Uh, so I, I think you just have to be careful about becoming too quote dependent. It can sometimes become a crutch. Grace, Michael. Grace, you go for you go ahead, Grace. I mean, I think that that's pretty much covered it all. It's it's mm -hmm. tempting, I think, too, when you write a feature and you get so ingrained in your subject that you do go out and you talk to six, seven, eight, sometimes 10, 11, 12 people, and you feel like, oh, well, they were nice enough to give me an interview. Mm -hmm. I have to quote them. And I think that that's like a guilt that we sometimes put on ourselves. Um, but like David was saying, like, it's just a lot of times you, you're in charge of telling this story for a reason and, and you have a grasp of it and you've talked to everyone in a way that they haven't. So, um, I try not to, especially with someone like Dabo, I try not to lean on quotes too much because literally my entire article would be quotes. <laughs> um, but I think it's just something you get a feel for. It, so. Yeah, I, I agree with, with David and Grace on that. Um, I was told early on in my career that quotes have to earn their way into your, your story. You know, um, don't just, you know, liberally have quotes everywhere because at, at some point you need to have creative transitions. Um, you know, basically the way I've, I've learned to use quotes is look at, look at it as a puzzle, you know, pieces of a puzzle and you get to control where the pieces go and they, where they fit best. Use some of those quotes as information to help you craft your transition, uh, paragraphs, um, to help you change from one aspect to another and, and allow the quotes to really earn their way into what the narrative that you're creating for this story is. So again, there's a different, uh, uh, it's a different mindset for a feature uh, where you do want to get a little bit more of the voice in versus uh, a news piece or a quick term piece where you want to get as much information and pertinent quotes in as possible from there. Thank you. And yeah, my, my TV career, it was always find three or four good quotes that actually said something and then weave that story in between them. I know Mike Reese, you do TV. Do you want to unmute and, and play along here? Is that, is that how you do your stuff? Thanks for adding me in, Dave. I would say it's completely different. TV is the quick soundbite versus the written piece is going to be different. So I'm almost like I, I might have one interview and I might use three different things for TV and that might not even see the written piece that I do. Might not be part of it. Anybody else have questions? Please feel free to throw them in chat or your, your little hand raised thing. Um, where were we going once we come out of this pandemic? Anybody want to weigh in on that? I was on a, a two hour webinar yesterday that uh, University of Miami Law School and Lead One were, were sponsors of. I don't know if anybody else was on that, but it was pretty interesting in hearing the financial issues, especially for college athletics that, uh, that they're all going to be facing and what the, the trickle down from that will be. Well, I, I, I think Dave, I mean, you, you've seen it there in, in your area. How many sports did Appalachian State put yesterday? Four, four I believe. Mm -hmm. what, three or three or four. And I mean, it's happening all, all over the country, Akron, Bowling Green, East Carolina, just, just cut four. 
uh, the, the, the echoes of this pandemic will be heard for quite some time, and I fear in our industry. And some of these advertising dollars uh, or investment capital or whatever it is that the, com that the media company is relying on may not come back. And that does not bode well for, for any of us. Uh, I thought Michael very eloquently talked earlier about showing up. And I've always operated under the uh, philosophy of, of visibility equals credibility. Mm -hmm. And I really worry, am I going to be able to be visible? Will the company pay for me to attend this, attend that, and to foster those relationships that become sources and become beneficial to the storytelling endeavor? I, I don't know that. Question here from Evan, when Grace mentioned calling her editor to talk about discussing the most important parts of the piece, that had me wondering, what are the most important good habits each of you have has developed as part of your writing process? Dave. Dave? Dave, can you hear me? Yes, Richard, how are you? Fine, how are you? Uh, uh, for those of you that don't, don't, don't know me, I'm Richard Broad. I'm not in the reporting business as much as most of you are. I, I do television, uh, primarily covering soccer. And um, I, I've heard the word preparation. And uh, Dave, you've referred to it a number of times, the importance in developing trust in your preparation. And just now alluding to it, whether you'll be able to go and probably do the preparation. It's, it's so important to, to, to do the job. and and. I'm just going to add this in my my business. The trust that you develop is not just trust with the athletic directors and the coaches and the people, but the trust of the people that you work with. And in, in television, uh, I'm an analyst, and I really need to interact with a person that's doing the play-by-play. -play. And many, many times I've found myself there with someone who, who really hasn't done the preparation, is just going to come on the scene, and winging it. And I know you've had, you all have had similar versions in reporting. Mike, I'm going to refer to you. Do you, you work with Pete Pranica at all with the Grizzlies? Um, please give him my best. He's a great guy. And I, I work with him and I cite him because I, I was a couple of years ago doing a game for ESPN, a Georgetown Princeton soccer game. And it was easy for me to go to Princeton. That's where I went to school. So I went back and I always try to go there. And it was fun for me to get there. And unbeknownst to me, Pete showed up the day before to watch the Princeton and the Georgetown teams train. And I was just, as a colleague of his, just so impressed that this guy's coming. He is doing a lot of different sports and he's in there preparing. And I think that's an important part of the whole component as we work to do anything, I'm not that familiar with the journalism, the, the uh, reporting, but Dave, as you mentioned, that's really an important component. And if that gets cut back by, by the stations and we aren't able to cover it, that's gonna take a lot out of, out of uh, the broadcasts and the, and the reporting is done in papers. So I, I think that's really, really important. I'm glad all of you have emphasized it and I hope we don't lose it. Oh, we really could. Good point. Agreed. Yeah, I, I, I can speak to that really quickly as well. Um, yes, I, Pete, Pete Pranica is, is one of my closest colleagues here uh, as, as a broadcaster, uh, as a mentor. And my best. He's a great guy. Yes, will do. And, and to your point, a real quick story about Pete that I, I take to every single opportunity that I have is this. I mean, Pete does these, and, and all of you guys who are in broadcast and, and, and TV or radio, the boards, the preparation boards, and it's a big placard or, or almost like a construction board uh, that he puts all kind of color, color coded ink and different notes on every single player on every single roster. And one of the things that Pete said that stuck with me and still sticks with me to this day is I'm only going to use 10 percent of everything you see on this board. The problem is I don't know which 10 percent that's going to be. 
So I have to prepare 100% across the board because you never know doing a broadcast which 10% of this I'm going to have to relate to. So I don't look at it as wasting 90% of my time. I look at it as being prepared for whatever 10% I have to be prepared for at that given time. And that's just a true professional uh, way of looking at things. And I, I've used that to apply in what I do. But I will say this, as someone who uh, radio play-by-play -play, uh, analyst and TV and the halftime and pregame, uh, we are concerned about access, uh, particularly as the pro sports come back. Are we going to be allowed in the bubble cities of the NBA? Are we going to be allowed on the sidelines to do sideline reporting uh, from, from some of these games? And if you remove that, even from a radio play-by-play, -play, if I'm sitting in a room outside of the arena watching a TV feed, is that a real way to do a radio play-by-play -play broadcast with analysts? Uh, I, there's a lot of discomfort and a lot of consternation about that, but we'll see how it plays out as we get closer to actual games. It's funny you bring that up, Mike. I was uh, walking the dog earlier. You might have heard her howling a little bit before, <laughs> but uh, one of my neighbors happens to be Wake Forest head athletic trainer. And for those who don't know, my, my literal and figurative sideline job is I'm a sideline reporter on radio for Wake football. And we were talking about, you know, he's, he's, he and his assistant athletic trainer have just gone back into the office. Um, and right now, everybody else on the staff is furloughed. So the football team, football players are supposed to come back 1st of July. Um, they don't know whether they're coming back. And then we were talking about sideline reporter. Well, you know, I think of myself as a non-essential personnel with, you know, who knows how much money that's going to be left. Will, they, will, will radio programs even have sideline reporters? You know, I don't know that. And then you think about it, if there are no fans in the stands, does my job now become essential or more essential than it was because nobody's there to see it. So those are all interesting things. Let me get back to Evan. If you want to unmute and ask your question, go right ahead. Yeah, thank you. I was also just going to say Pete Pranica, by the way, is uh, who I first heard from about this Zoom session. I eventually saw him with me, Mike, but um, it was cool to see Pete uh, recommend this. That's how I found out. Um, but yeah, Grace, when you, mentioned about calling your editor to sort of talk about the most important aspects of the story. Uh, that kind of struck me as like, it seems like a good habit that you've developed as part of your process. So for all three of you, what have been other good habits that you have made a point to keep up with, you know, either from the start of your career or something along the way in your career that you realized I need to keep doing this? Um, yeah, so I always, I do always call my editor just to, it, that's a good way for me to not only know, know that she knows what's coming from me, but for me to kind of speak it into existence, if you will. Um, I am the first to admit I really could benefit from outlining more. I think sometimes I can be uh, kind of like spazzy in my writing sometimes, and I think that some structure would be good for me. So that's something I've been trying to to work on a little bit more. But you know, really, it sounds cliche, but I, I find that I write my best just when I have a clear head, you know, and so if that means like, I need to go exercise for a minute, like I try to release any guilt of, oh my gosh, I'm not working, you know, I, I try to do things that, you know, keep me physically, mentally, you know, emotionally, like all, all good, so that when I write down, I have a, a clear head, so, um, but man, like Mike was saying, like sometimes writing is just the worst thing in the entire world. <laughs> I, I, I think, Dave, that, that challenge to keep your head clear and such is much, is much different now with more and more of us working from home, not just during the pandemic, but even, even before this, for decades, I was an office rat and was every day you know, interacting with colleagues and such. And then my routine changed with the growth of our family and such, and I became a, a work-at-home guy. And, it, and it's much different. You do have to be much more disciplined, and uh, you do have to just get up and, and walk around sometimes and, and clear your mind of the distractions, perhaps, that are uh, in the house. And, and I find just in, in the transcribing of, and I think we can all agree, transcribing sucks. It's the worst. 
And God bless anyone who invents a really reliable transcribing app. But the, the, that process sometimes, getting those words on the screen just triggers ideas. And I, I think that can be, be very helpful. Um, I think for me, it's, it's, it's one of those situations where uh, what makes your angle unique? Where can you find, uh, particularly if you're covering something where there are other reporters, you know, Grace is covering Clemson, that's a national beat. Um, you know, Dave is on a national, you know, a, a lot of national stories, um, whether it's golf or whatever kind of events are going on. What can you bring that will make your vantage point unique from anything else that anyone else can get? And that can allow you an entry point to your story and to your storytelling that will make your piece a little bit unique. So in, in a day and age where my fear is that a lot of our access is now going to come from Zoom conferences of players and coaches and athletic directors, we're all going to have the same equal sort of feel when it comes to that your preparation of what you know going into those things are gonna be even more uh, vital uh, to do. So your preparation going in and what unique angle can you bring to a piece that no one else has. Grace mentioned structure. How important is structure to what you do and how you operate? I think well, structure, like structure in terms of like your story or just like your life? <laughs> um, probably both. Uh, they're both equally, well, I shouldn't say they're equally important. Your life structure is obviously way more important than any story. Um, but I think that there is a little bit of correlation. You know, I think when you're in a good space and a good headspace and, um, you know, David was talking about working from home, like maybe carving out a space that is your workspace. Like this is where you do your professional things. Um, I think they go hand in hand probably more than we think they do because by the end of writing, you're just ready to chuck your computer out the window but um structure in a story i think is everything for your reader you don't the last thing you want is for your reader to to finish your story and be confused so um i think that's that's as crucial to me as any part of the writing process mike yeah and i think uh if, if, if reese is still on the call here um you know i'm familiar with that that ESPN structure when I was with ESPN for, for six years with the heat index and the NBA, um, knowing how to, what, what's going to work for your, your quick sports center hit, having a nugget that you can save for that, using what you need to use for your actual written piece, and also being able to shape and use other pieces uh, to, to, to shape your social media presentation. Um, so different ways that you structure your information, uh, you don't want to have the same captions for every single thing. So there's always going to be, I call them little, uh, it's kind of funny, my, I, I call them Skittles. It's little <laughs> Skittles of information. <laughs> you tell them a, a candy junkie at one point. Um, but there's always different ways that you can be creative in terms of how you're presenting your piece based on the format that it's going to be disseminated. in. Sounds good. Um, anybody else have a question? Feel free just to unmute and go ahead. Robert Eggleston did ask another one. Uh, Robert, why don't you just unmute and ask if you like, rather than me reading it. Um, I'm not, I can't remember which one I asked. What was that? About camaraderie. About what? Camaraderie among sports writers. Oh, yeah. I'm just curious if, if y'all feel like sports writers are better comrades to each other and than the people that are in the business um, new, or business writing or in um, political writing and that sort of thing. I mean, have you mostly found that your comrades are not trying to, to, you know, elbow you out of the way and that you can trust them. I, I heard that story about Bill Brill and Bill Millsaps, and it sounds like, you know, those guys, even though they were kind of iconic in Virginia, that they really worked with uh, David and n nurtured him. Well, Robert, they, they absolutely did. And, and I think there is a, a, a press box or a press row camaraderie, per perhaps more so than in other areas of journalism. I don't know since I've never worked in others, although I would imagine, say, the writer, the writers and reporters who are on, say, the campaign trail, there, there's got to be some misery loves company component to that, right? 
or daily briefings by the Corona Task Force, maybe? Yeah, just yeah. that that kind of stuff. But you know, some of my best friends I see in in the press box who are quote unquote c competitors, but they're, they're good friends. Uh, when uh, Virginia Tech played football at Old Dominion a couple years ago, Old Dominion's about, I don't know, 35, 45 minutes from my home. I had the whole beat crew over the house the night before the game. We just hung out and sat on the deck and ate pizza and had a few adult beverages and enjoyed each other's company. Uh, so, yeah, I... I think I think there's a whole lot of camaraderie going on. Yeah, there, there's no question. That's the best part of this line of yeah. work. I, I, I the think games depends, are secondary. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think that because you spend so much time uh, in press boxes uh, on, on the road. I mean, I know a lot of NBA guys, uh, particularly doing playoff series from teams that are closely uh, located geographically. They 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 hop in a car, rent a car, and drive together from you know, Boston to Philadelphia or New York to Philadelphia or something like that. But I also know I'm, I'm probably dating myself here. One of my interns back when uh, Newhouse News Service was still strong uh, was 1996 presidential campaign. And it was, you know, Bob Dole. And, uh, you know, I was on the, the Bob Dole campaign at that point as an intern. And we all felt like that media contingent was we, we were all in this together dealing with some difficulty in terms of how that campaign was operating. So we were united by the difficulty that we were facing. I also remember maybe uh, uh, you know, 10 years ago when Saban was with the Dolphins and the whole uh, press conference, I'm not going to take the Alabama job. We were all united in, man, this guy is a total, total butthole. You know what I'm saying? So, but then there are also you know, other situations where I remember a coaching hire for an SEC job you know, years ago. And I had a better relationship with the athletic department administration and the school administration uh, one of my competitors, who's a colleague, but even you know, a competitor with a different paper, had a better relationship with a couple of the agents of the candidates who were uh, in the running. So we would sort of pool resources in that way to make sure I had access to the, the, mm. the candidates and he had access to some of the things that the administration was thinking. Not sharing quotes, but just sharing perspectives. And it made both of our papers and our, our story stronger in that way, too. Well, and, and I'm just a local board member here in Winston-Salem, but I feel like in sitting in on these calls the last month or so, that whether it's sports writers amongst themselves or sports casters and sports writers to each other, there seems to be an incredible admiration um, for the great work that's being done. So, I mean, we've seen that over and over. Grace, I'm really curious as to whether my daughter was at Chapel Hill when you were there, but I won't ask your age. Oh, go, go ahead. I graduated in uh, 2015. So five years ago. Uh, you, she's older than you. <laughs> but you, you play older by the fact that you um, you have gone where you've gone in this world already. So it's pretty impressive. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Diane Blix, do you have a question? Would you like to unmute and ask? You're chairman of the board. Yeah. Thank yes. you. Thank you, Robert. Chairperson. <laughs> <laughs> You know, Robert touched on it. These sessions are so important to us and we feel like it's our way of supporting the membership in these difficult times. And as I listen to you and the, the talent that's represented here, I'm in awe. Um, it occurred to me that you're a great group to ask about awards weekend 2021. I gotta tell you, when we had to cancel the awards weekend of 2020, it was the hardest meeting any of us have ever been to. And so as I turn the page and I think about June of 2021, could you offer us any advice um, about what, what would make it a really special weekend as we celebrate all the winners from 2020 and next year? If you don't mind sharing if you've been or you haven't been, um, what would make it a great weekend? We'd really appreciate it as we plan for that event those events and if you haven't been been you really ought to come it's incredible I, I went to a couple in Salisbury before it moved up here and then been to the ones here it's pretty incredible and I'm not I don't even know I just know a few of you folks I don't know very many of you, you you're a great group and we would value any uh any suggestions you have well I was I was in the uh uh 
invited to, to speak on uh, a panel for the 2019 awards this past year. And um, it was, it was a phenomenal time. I mean, just to be able to, you know, the, the, the days that led up to uh, the award ceremony, uh, the award ceremony itself was just fantastic. I still can remember verbatim Tony Kornheiser, Doris Burke and uh, Adrian Wojnarowski's uh, uh, accepting speeches for their awards. And I remember Woj, who I work with uh, in the NBA and I've worked with him at ESPN uh, calling for more uh, diversity uh, among uh, the, the body, the membership, as well as the awards. And, and I, that resonated with me. And, and I know that there are some challenges out there uh, with hiring and maintaining jobs and making sure we have women represented, uh, minorities represented. And I really feel like the organization uh, is moving in that direction. And it was, it, was, it was great to see that. So I look forward to coming back and presenting. Uh, I've already given my commitment to Dave for as many years <laughs> as he needs me, I'll be there. And, and I'm looking forward to, uh, to, to encouraging more students and more young professionals to join on board as well. Thank Mike, you. Let, me, let me ask you this. Um, you had how many people, give or take, at your presentation last June? Ooh, uh, you gave me the double room, remember? So <laughs> my room was pretty, was pretty packed. I, I had one of those joints, the A-B sessions right. or whatever. So mm -hmm. it was, I, I would say probably uh, one of the sessions was maybe 50, 60, uh, somewhere around there, if I remember correctly. Um, and it was right before, either right after lunch. So that might've impacted uh, how many people came or didn't come. But I was, I was happy with the group and uh, they wanted to stay longer and I wanted to stay longer. So mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. I, I was going to ask you if, if there was a way to increase the attendance, just not that anybody's isn't important, but I, I think, so for those who don't know, Mike, Mike talked about, uh, you know, the, the intersection of, it's almost the undefeated, the intersection mm -hmm. of culture, race, and sports. Mm -hmm. uh, he had done it in Nashville at the conference. Uh, he and I both presented that, and, and I, was, I was very taken with his presentation, so invited him to do it last year, but I don't want anyone to miss it. So mm -hmm. what, you know, do you have any suggestions for us on how we can get more people to that presentation? Especially, I mean, you know, just look at, what, at what's happened in the last couple of days, and we see you know, the microcosm of you know, sports as life. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, I, I think you guys do a great job with it. It's just one of those situations where uh, timing, location, and all of those things can be challenging. Uh, but there are also challenges that if you really want to be a part of it, you work through it. Um, you know, reaching out to uh, encourage some of the award winners to, to promote it, you know, uh, on their social media and, and through their organizations as well. And uh, really branch out. At that time, schools are out for the most part. It's the summertime for... Uh, most universities, uh, but if there are some summer sessions that are going on at that time, inviting them to either join in uh, digitally as we are all growing in the digital space now because of this or physically, uh, that's also an option too. But you guys do a great job with it, man. And I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate and lucky that our paths cross to where we can, we can meet up and do this. Yeah, appreciate what you do, Mike, thanks. Um, and that's, I think, you know, we, this is the fifth one of these we've done. I think these are, are now a permanent part of an SMA culture, which is, which is fun. How about you younger guys out there who either are graduating or have just graduated or are still in school? Um, think about maybe some topics that you would like to hear us or see us do and um, you know, feel free to unmute and let us know now or you can email me, whichever, um, or anyone else for that matter. Dave, I have, I have found that in, in attending some of, of, of those sessions, awards weekend, I found them very valuable from an information gathering uh, perspective for, for stories. Last year's session on the ACC network with, with Wes Durham was there and, and all the ESPN brass. I mean, I was just rotating around all of them e even afterward getting a, a nugget here. I think Grace might have been at, at the same session that, that, that I was. And I, I, I seem to recall her interviewing some of the, the, the same folks. And that was terrific. I remember one you did with college basketball officials mm -hmm. with uh, Brian Kersey and 
I forget some of the other guys. Like Eads. Like Eads, who's now, who's now retired and, and, and taken the coordinator's job with the Southeastern Conference. And Bill Covington and fellow NSMA board member Tim Nestor. That's right. And in, in those sessions, I'm walking out of there going, I've got a couple stories in the notebook. So they're, they're valuable from, from that perspective as well. Don't, don't be shy about selling that angle to, to, to the membership either. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. I, you know, I, I like to come up with a mix. I, I tell people it's the kind of the balancing act between wanting to make it interesting for us, our people who come and yet entertaining for maybe, you know, spouses, boyfriends, girlfriends, other friends who, who come and might not care about sports as much as we all do. But there, I mean, they're an endless supply, I think, of ideas. And, and the gratifying thing for me is that I have not been turned down by anyone when I ask them to, to present. So that's, uh, I'm going to talk about the camaraderie of, of our industry, Robert. There, There's a feather in the hat right there. That's anyway, we've... Go ahead, Dave. I'm sorry. That's your charm. <laughs> oh, glad. Good thing my wife isn't within earshots. <laughs> um, we've we've gone over our, our our time, so let me uh, let me just wrap up by saying thank you to Michael, Grace, and David for uh, being our panelists today, and everybody else for tuning in. Uh, appreciate it, and we'll uh, we'll be right back here Tuesday at four o'clock with making it to the majors with three very young people who have just gotten their start in uh, major league professional sports. So I uh, hope you can join us then. Don't forget to, if you haven't already, register on our website and look forward to seeing anybody. If you have any other questions, feel, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, my email address, if you don't already know it, dgorin at nationalsportsmedia.org. It's on the website. And uh, thanks again. Good to see everybody. Have a great weekend. Thank you all. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for having thanks, us. Guys.